All right, let's start this morning. I'm going to pray for us, and then uh, we'll get going. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study your word yet again this week. We're grateful for what you have taught us in, throughout your scriptures this morning in the book of Amos. <clears throat> Help us, Lord, to be cognizant of not only what it meant in history, but what it meant, means for us in the present. We're grateful for what you've taught us through your scriptures and through your spirit. Amen. Well, for those of you who uh, might remember, uh, actually this guy was in our midst a couple of years ago. His name was Taylor Sorensen. And I still remember him as a high school student of mine in Adrian, Michigan. And I remember that he sat right over here on this side of the room, if I'm looking this direction. And every once in a while as I was teaching something, I would smile and look at him and point and say, you know, Taylor, there's a song in there somewhere. And wouldn't you know that he's now gone on to Nashville and cut any number of albums. And some of his songs actually have been used in movies and in television programming. Uh, I suggest him uh, this morning because one of the things that we did in our class was uh, do active learning processes. I still uh, do that kind of uh, thing in education. And what I mean by that is trying to get students to do that which we are talking about in class. So this one particular class we were discussing in the general area of God's justice and his judgment. And I asked the students to uh, page through hymnals and find out how many hymnals or how many hymns in the hymnal were about God's grace and love and mercy and how many uh, songs in the hymnal were about God's hate, wrath, and anger. Well, they couldn't find any about God's hate, wrath, and anger, even though the multiplicity of statements within the text of Scripture are huge and overflowing uh, to that attribute of God. So Taylor, amongst other of the students, actually wrote a hymn, and his hymn was about God's justice and about God's judgment. Well, I was always in the uh, act of trying to get other people to hear my students, so we actually sent... Uh, Taylor's hymn, along with other hymns, to R.C. Sproul. Some of you who might know who R.C. Sproul is, very famous Reformed theologian, died a couple of years ago. And R.C. actually wrote us back. And what he wrote to Taylor was, thank you so much for this hymn, because there is such a paucity, I love that word, paucity, there is such a paucity or lack of hymns on God's hate and wrath and anger, even though that those concepts run all the way through Scripture. I say that again. So you might get a sense of where we might be going in Amos today uh, based on this opening illustration and introdu introduction. Uh, we have a plethora, many, uh, references in this particular book to God's hate and wrath and anger. In fact, so much so it just kind of brimming over in the book of Amos. But to begin, let's talk about Amos himself. Amos was the son of a fig picker. I just like saying that phrase. Uh, that's an old uh, King James Version phrase, so I'm going to say it one more time. Amos was the son of a fig picker. Uh, this is, uh, brings just a smile to my face every time I think of it. But Amos's name actually meant a load. And also fr from the load comes with it pain, as in taking a load alongside of you. So. You could actually uh, translate Amos' name as, here comes the pain. And not in the sense of he's bringing the pain, but in the sense of he is the pain. <laughs> so this is really crucial when we get to this passage in Amos chapter 7, verses 10 to 17. In this passage, one of the prophets of Israel, we'll get to all of the background to this in a moment, but you need to hear about Amos. Uh, Amos is confronted by one of the prophets of Israel who is a false prophet. His name was Amaziah. And Amaziah gets up in, a in Amos's face and he says, Why don't you go down south where you belong? See, Amos was from the southern nation of Judah and he was coming up to the northern nation of Israel. Again, we'll come back to that geographical emphasis in a moment. But he said basically, Why don't you go back home where you belong? That's basically what he's saying to Amos. And the whole point that Amos brings out is, look, I was no prophet, nor, I was, nor was I a son of a prophet. 
but God was the one who chose me. And oh, by the way, because of what you've just said to me, not only are you going to die in real pain and degradation, but your family and your name's going to be wiped out. What do you think about that, Amaziah? So here you have uh, Amos, and here now perhaps you can get a sense of this idea. Uh, this is the reason why he might have been called, been called, here comes the pain, in the sense that he was the pain. Uh, he's going to be bringing it real hot and heavy here in this particular book. So remember this slide. I've told you every week we'll reintroduce this slide again. And I've highlighted this from the beginning of our teaching here, that these are five major ideas that are coming out of the prophets, the minor prophets, uh, all of the prophets, but we're focused on the minor prophets. And what you're going to hear from Amos today is an emphasis on numbers three and four. The message of judgment on sin and the voice of Amos, which is explosive and bombastic. Uh, Amos is not going to let anything lie. He's not going to let anything uh, slide off the table. Everything is going to be brought to bear in terms of God's judgment on sin and the sin of the northern kingdom. So, I wanted to highlight some background, some historic background to this particular book so you get a sense of uh, what Amos is doing and what particular time he, he is doing this uh, particular uh, preaching and prophesying. First of all, we need to understand in the book of Amos that there was uh, a division between the kingdoms, that is, between Israel and Judah. So Israel being the northern kingdom, Judah being the southern kingdom. Ten tribes in the north, two in the south. Well, there was this general hostility, which happened probably about 150 years before uh, Amos was prophesying, which, by the way, shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody in the United States of America that we are talking about something that took place over 150 years ago called the Civil War, and guess what? We're still talking about that. So can you imagine that even during this day that there would be great animosity from north to south and back again, and that people in both kingdoms couldn't stand each other? That's essentially what's going on here as we think about national disunity, which you know, kind of is also reflective of our own nation state at the moment. Military superiority. There was a, a great emphasis on this throughout the history books, and uh, you might want to go back to this, by the way, as always, on the handouts. All of these uh, slides and all the information on the slides are on your handouts. But if you want to go back and read some of the history of this, go back to 2 Kings 14 and 2 Chronicles 26. During this period of time, Assyria, which was the major superpower of the day, had become weakened. And so the northern uh, state of Israel was really kind of uh, left to themselves. And they were enlarging their borders, and things were going well for them, and they thought they were really on the up and up, and they were going to be able to take care of themselves. So uh, then we come into this economic prosperity. So you're going to see in the book of Amos how Amos over and over and over again rails against the people for their wantonness as it relates to riches and how they treat the poor because of it. And then finally, their religious activity. Uh, again, reading the book of Amos over and over and over again, Amos is saying, God hates your sacrifices. He can't stand the fact that you just put on your Sunday best on Sunday, come to church like you're all righteous and everything, and really you're living lives uh, that need to be judged. And so in these, in these uh, historic backdrops, the cultural understanding of Amos, we kind of get a general sense of the fact that, you know what, what we he hear and see in Amos is kind of like what we hear and see in the church in the United States. So keep that in mind as you think about the cultural context of all of this. So the very first thing we find out in the book of Amos is that Amos does something very interesting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this in the next slide. But what he does is he focuses at his attention on other nation states ahead of Israel. And I wanted to make sure that we get a sense of this because what we find in uh, these particular chapters is Amos focusing his attention on unbelieving people. So think about that for a minute. Obviously, God is going to bring judgment against the house of Israel first. 1 Peter 4 is pretty clear about that. Judgment begins with the house of God. But I wanted you to notice this in particular, that the ideas behind Amos 1 and 2 are really ideas that flow all the way through Scripture. 
And this is the key, that everybody, every human person is imbued not only with the image of God, but with conscience. Now, conscience does not save us. We find that over and over again in Scripture, Ephesians 4, 17 and 19, for instance, very clear about how conscience doesn't save. But in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, we're also very clearly told that conscience is actually going to indicate our unrighteousness or the fact that we have this conscience that has been given to us from creation, from God, and we are guilty of it if we usurp it. And so in these first two chapters, Amos says, every one of these nation states is worthy of uh, an expression of cruelty and oppression. We'll talk about some of those in just a moment. But I wanted you to see, ultimately, that all people are responsible for what Amos is about to say. So, one of the things that uh, comes out of my dealings in everyday life is that every once in a while I'm on Twitter. Not very often, because it goes way too fast for me. But every once in a while I'll see something that uh, needs to have some kind of response. So this particular week, uh, somebody wrote about the abuse of power is a matter of racial privilege. And I took a bit of umbrage with that and responded this way. To suggest that one group alone is susceptible to one kind of sin over others is itself its own kind of privilege. <laughs> to think that somehow only one group of people or only one uh, nation state or any uh, ethnicity or nationality or language group or whatever is more responsible for one sin than another is absolutely against what Scripture teaches. Right. Our focus as scriptural understanding people is that humanity is shot through, permeated with sinfulness. And therefore, it's not legislated just against one group or another group. It's about all people. It is, as I said in a separate kind of response, I also said, this is not an issue of an ethnic problem, it's an issue of a human problem. Yeah. This is the problem that we face. So, uh, just to kind of give you an example or an illustration of some of that kind of stuff that we deal with. So I mentioned to you a moment ago that we're going to talk about the geographical setting again, and I wanted you to notice about Amos that what he does is kind of like this curly Q uh, focus on Israel, where he starts outside of Israel proper, goes all around them, and then ultimately points his finger at the nation state, the northern kingdom of Israel. But here are the first seven. So first of all, he deals with Syria, then the Palestinian territory, then Lebanon, Jordan, Jordan again, Jordan, some more, and Moab, and ultimately Judah. So these seven areas of life, or these seven nation states, uh, were the first target of Amos judgment from God. Well, Israel, the northern kingdom, realizes, oh, seven, that's the perfect number. I guess maybe we've been left out. We got off, we're off the hook now. And so, but what happens is, is that God says, uh, here's your real problem. You thought you were better than everybody else, but you're number eight. So here's, here's what's going on here in this whole number bit. If you look at Amos chapters 1 and 2, you will see this over and over and over again, that God says, for three transgressions and for four, all the way through the first two chapters of Amos, for three transgressions, yea, for four. So the whole point of these statements is that God is saying, you think it's this bad? I'm going to add one more to show you that it's even worse than that. So think about that in terms of the seven nation states and Israel being number eight. Seven was considered to be the perfect number in Hebrew. So when Judah was the seventh nation judge, Israel thought they were off the hook. But God says, three, yea, four. How about seven, yea, four, eight? He's saying, you think you're off the hook because I got to the perfect number without you? No, it's, it's even worse than that. You're even beyond that. You're worse than that. You're number eight. So there's a focus then on uh, Israel's problem, and the issue of the number seven really kind of rings out here to us. So one of the problems uh, that, that we see not only in our own culture around us on a regular basis, that people are wanting to call out the sin that they particularly hate, but I wanted you to notice this particular passage from uh, chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. This is one of the examples that 
Amos gives about this nation state of Ammon. And he says this, For three transgressions of the Ammonites and for four I will not re revoke the punishment because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead that they might enlarge their border. Now that's a real active physical ripping open pregnant women in Gilead. This is not an unusual event. Um, if you were going to wipe out somebody else's people group, you started with the pregnant women. In fact, you killed the women or you raped them so that you would have then your seed being promoted throughout the future. Uh, this is not an unusual thing to be happening in the ancient Near Eastern world. But God says, finger wagging against my enemies only exacerbates God's judgment against me. So he's saying, look, Ammon is really bad, but wait for it, I'm about to get to you. Hang on. So when you live in a debauched culture, it's pretty easy to make yourself feel good about your own sin. Mm -hmm. That's the essence of this. And it's something we all ought to be cognizant of. And the fact that it's real easy for us to point fingers out there instead of realizing we need to point them here. And our reference, of course, to this against all kinds of whatever hatred uh, or violence we want to, to suggest uh, really does get to this particular issue. But let's make this real practical, real personal. So this week, uh, Robin introduced me to a new book, in, new to me. I think it was published in 2013. It's called The Invisible Boy. Robin told me what the book was about, and I immediately thought, I am not going to read this book. <laughs> Mostly because I, I have this tender soul about little children. And here's this story about a little boy who's left out. He goes to school and he's left out of all the activities. He's not included in any friendships. You see another uh, picture of this on the right hand side of the slide uh, where he's left alone and everybody else is having a good time without him at the lunch table. Robin told me that the story does end well, but she said when I go to read this in my second grade classroom, I'm going to really in her words, have to suck it up. <laughs> and I, I don't blame her. I don't know if I could read that thing uh, out loud to anybody else. But my suggestion to you about this is, is this. Who are we leaving out? You know, we, we talk a lot about everybody's sin out there and all of the evil that we see and any kind of the latest problems of whatever. But are we doing this? Amen. Is, this is a really important idea here. Are we taking care of everybody? Are we at least making sure that somebody is taking care of everybody? So here's another example of this. Uh, this week, uh, I, I uh, delivered a paper uh, to Sagamore Institute here in Indianapolis, actually, uh, on neurodiversity, which simply means that uh, we all have different brains. But my focal point was on autism. And uh, I started the paper by talking about Temple Grandin. If you've never seen the movie Temple Grandin, okay, this afternoon, run to Prime or, or uh, Netflix or wherever you can find it and watch Temple Grandin. This is a very powerful and important film from 2008 that really gets after the issue of how people are different from us and how we need to be cognizant of that and not leave folks out and the emphasis, of course, on our responsibility toward people. On the right-hand side is an actual picture of Temple Grandin. She holds a PhD and she uh, teaches uh, near Boulder, Colorado. Uh, she's very well known and uh, has done tremendous things uh, for lots of different individuals and places. And specifically, her focal point is on animals, but I'll let you find that for yourself. Uh, how do we take care of others? How are we cognizant of this in the lives of people? So going back to a little bit of review again, you remember uh, last week we talked about Hosea and we said uh, that Israel stops right here. The Israelite nation stops and God is laughing at Israel. Ha! Hosea and Amos. So those are our, our two books that we've really focused on uh, to begin this series just to give you again a sense of this. So last week we focused on Hosea who had and emphasized this, uh, the people's disregard for Yahweh. So they were worshiping all these other gods. And if you remember, uh, I gave you an example of all of the Baals that I worship. And I just started with the A's, as you recall. Uh, and I only got through five of them, but there's a whole bunch more. 
And there's a, a disregard for Yahweh when we worship these other things, when these other things become more important to us. This week in Amos, there's not a disregard for Yahweh as much as there's a disregard for people. So just for a moment, consider, what does Jesus say based on Leviticus and Deuteronomy? Our responsibility is to love God, and by, we do this by loving our neighbor. We demonstrate our love for God by loving our neighbor. So God says, yeah, in the first book, you're disregarding me. In the second book, you're disregarding people, which basically are the two great commandments. This is your problem. So one of the things that we find, again, in Amos uh, chapter 2, is that all this stuff comes up. Now the focal point is on the nation of Israel itself. So in chapter 2, verses 6 to 16, we find all of these emphases on greed and pride and immorality and hypocrisy. And I wanted just to uh, focus on one of these. I think greed pretty much uh, speaks for itself. There's many references to pride. I didn't write all of those down. But I wanted to say something about this issue of immorality. And one of the things that uh, was going on actually between men in a household. So uh, here is this uh, statement in chapter 2 and verse 7. He's talking about trampling the head of the poor and turning aside the way of the afflicted. And listen to this statement. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. What does that mean? That means that the girl emphasized here in Hebrew is a servant girl. She has absolutely no recourse to suggest that she has been raped by men in this family. And yet, this was a regular practice in the northern kingdom of Israel that uh, men would take advantage of women because they had no other recourse. Because what's true? They wanted to make sure they kept their job. And if you really have some stomach for stuff like this, I highly recommend uh, a movie called uh, Dirty, Pretty Dirty Things, Dirty Pretty Things, uh, which is all about how uh, people who are elites mistreat the poor in the city, and it's a very important film, I think, for a lot of reasons. But that kind of gets after some of the hypocrisy that's going on in the northern kingdom of Israel. So, hypocrisy of belief. Do we only hang on to the words from God that best suit us? I probably have said stuff like this before, but let me say this again. I can't stand it when people only want to talk about Jeremiah 29, 11, God has a plan for me to prosper me. But they leave out Jeremiah 18, 11, which says, God has a plan to destroy me. Mm -hmm. Now, how come nobody takes this one as their life verse? That's what I want to know. <laughs> you know, why, why are we picking and choosing life verses, you know, just taking the ones that seem to fit uh, nicely in our nice little comfortable lives, and we just kind of disregard the things about the justice of God? I'd just like to you know, point that out because I see this as tremendous hypocrisy, even in the way that we promote or talk about the scriptures. So our problem is this. We only want to identify the kind of evil that we hate while casting a blind eye toward evil of every kind from every other source. So if our focus and we th what we think is really, really bad, and we really want to nail somebody, then we're going to talk about that all day long. But if it's somebody that comes from our side of the tracks or from our political spectrum or from our social group, oh, we're never going to talk bad about them. We're never going to bring up articles or suggestions about them. Why is that? Because they're not on our social spectrum. Look, this happens all the time, and we're all susceptible to this. So I'm suggesting a practice for us all in this regard. If you promote something from the news that you already believe is evil, point out evil from other political perspectives you believe to be good. Because guess what? Everybody's going to get nailed. Everybody's going to get nailed. And that's the way it ought to be. It strikes me to say this, that one of the sadnesses of comedy in the last, oh, eight to ten years is that nobody actually wants to point fingers anymore at uh, evil or at anything that might smack of something that's hip hypocritical. And what's really sad about this is that Comedy has lost its edge. It's lost its truth-telling ability. Think about what comedy does. Comedy actually calls out and points out problems in a society or in a group of people. But we're no longer able to actually have comedy that does that because we've lost the basis for truth. 
So once you lose the basis for truth upon which comedy cannot operate without, then you lose the ability to actually be sarcastic and in a way that calls people out to uh, issues of justice. So for what that's worth, thought I'd throw that in there. What's our response to any of this? This is the piece of Amos that really is the centerpiece of the whole book. Seek good, not evil, hate evil, and love good. This is the right smack dab in the middle of the book of Amos. It reminds me of this uh, statement in 3 John where we have this comparison between two men, Diotrephes and Demetrius. Diotrephes is a guy who wants to get over on everybody else. He's really proud and arrogant, and he doesn't want to listen to anybody except for himself. Demetrius, however, John says, is somebody who can be trusted. Uh, he's somebody who's actually demonstrated his life of goodness by doing good. And so he says, don't imitate evil, but imitate good. Whatever does good, or whoever does good, is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. This is the focal point of Amos. Do good. Now, what is good? That's the first question anybody should ask. What's good? Well, according to Scripture, goodness is based on the standard of righteousness of God. He sets the standard. This is the problem, by the way, just as another sidebar comment. Whenever we talk about justice, whenever we call for justice, and we don't recognize that there's a standard for justice that has to establish, be established first, we run roughshod toward whatever justice we think is just without examining the standard for righteousness which should undergird justice. Think of anything that's going on right now in the political social spectrums. Everything should be evaluated from a just uh, point of view, but with righteousness as the standard for that. And if you don't have a righteous standard, then you really can't call for justice. So this happened uh, a few, uh, actually a couple of decades ago. I was uh, asked to preach at uh, a young people's event. There were 300 uh, teenagers coming to this after the football game, and I was told I was going to be preaching to them at midnight. So after the football game is over, and after the locker room and all that kind of stuff, I get to preach at midnight. And then after that, they were going to go do other events like bowling or whatever, and they were going to be all done at 4 in the morning. Well, you know. So I get up to preach at midnight. And when I was given this assignment, the, the uh, person who asked me to do this said, we want you to speak in a way that invites unbelievers to uh, faith, to evangelism. So half of the group was, uh, were kids who professed salvation. The other half was not. So I start off with an illustration. At that point in life was a very direct point of view, which was about uh, the nightmare on Elm Street, uh, starring Freddy Krueger, of course. Uh, but this particular uh, preachment actually came out of Amos chapter 6 and verse 1, which uh, says that you are, you who are at ease in Zion, you are going to die. And so the whole point of the Freddy Krueger movies is if you fall asleep, you die. And what was the point of the director in this? Falling asleep was akin to apathy. If you become apathetic in your culture, if you, care, if you refuse to care any longer about things that matter in your culture, you will then fall asleep and you will die. That was the whole point behind the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, just in case you ever wanted to know. So I used this as the basis for Amos 6.1 and my preaching that particular night. The kids loved it because, you know, here's this evangelical pastor standing up and preaching from Amos but using Freddy Krueger, and they thought that was really cool. And I was quoting all kinds of rock lyrics and all the rest as well, because who's my audience? Yeah. yeah. So there it is. If you fall asleep, if you become apathetic, you will die. The same statement is being made in Amos as is made in a horror movie, which should tell us something about maybe how we ought to communicate to a culture uh, that really doesn't believe in a biblical uh, base at all. One of my favorite lines out of out of Amos, you go check these things out. Amos chapter 4 references the cows of Bashan, and it is specifically directed toward the women of northern Israel, calling them cows. Now, I tried desperately to find all of the uh, license plate uh, letters and words that were no longer acceptable anywhere in the country. I figured cows had to be on there at some point, you know. 
but I couldn't find it. I honestly think that probably nobody in any state uh, uses that particular word in any license plate. It's rather derogatory, as you might imagine. Well, I wanted you to know why Amos references the cows of Bashan. The, na or the area of Bashan was in the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee. It was a lush, fertile area, and all the cattle that were there were plump and hardy. They were really uh, being fattened up for the kill. The cows was a metaphor of prosperity, and in that passage it goes on to say that the women as well as the men took advantage of the poor. This is not just a male issue. This is a human issue, once again. So we can talk all we want about consumerism, but it's our ease with riches that gets us in trouble every single time. What are we doing with the monies that have been given to us by God? And how do we appropriate these things and take care of the people who are marginalized in, in a culture, in any kind of culture? What are we doing? So five times right after this, after he talks about the cows and Bashan in chapter 4, 6 to 13, he talks about in, in five separate statements he says, I've done this, but you didn't return to me. I did this, but you didn't return to me. Over and over and over again. Very reminiscent of places like Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, where the same kind of idea crops up. I gave you a chance. You dissed me. I gave you another chance. You dissed me again. And on and on and on. God says, I gave you all these opportunities to listen. I've been sending you the prophets. All of this stuff, you haven't done any listening. Uh, this is the reason why you're going to be judged. So, here's an example of this, again, out of the four oracles, Amos chapters 3 through 6. Uh, God says to the northern uh, nation of Israel, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. His focal point has been on his people all the way through First Testament teaching from Genesis chapter 12 and on. But guess what? God says you bear more responsibility than anybody else. So I'm picking up on this theme in Matthew chapter 11, 20 to 24, where Jesus actually excoriates these three towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And he says, if what was done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, pagan places, those folks would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But you've refused me. And what's the issue here? Jesus is saying, not only was I here, in your presence. You had my words, and I did miracles here, and you refused me. So here is God saying this to, in the book of Amos to his people, saying, look, you have absolutely gone away from my word. You have done things that are absolutely wrong, and you continue to spurn the words that I've sent through the prophets. So in the last few chapters of Amos, and we don't have obviously time to run through all of these passages, I wanted to pull out one of these references to God's judgment. Because remember, after this is over, uh, the ten nations are going to be scattered to the wind, and very important that we understand that. But before we get there, when I was a kid, uh, I did an awful lot of work for my father. Uh, you could probably have called me an indentured servant to my father. I did all kinds of things uh, at our household. And one of the things I remember specifically was uh, building things uh, with him and specifically using something called a plumb line. Now, for those of you who are not in construction or you don't have any clue about any of that kind of stuff, understand that you pick a point above uh, where it is, let's say you're doing a stone wall right here. And you pick a point above the stone wall and you hang a plumb line. The plumb line is anchored by this heavy metal piece and as soon as it stops swinging and it comes to a place, you are then able to see whether or not your measurement is equal or uh, equidistant from top to bottom. So it's level all the way across its face. Well, that's exactly one of the metaphors that God uses about his people. Exactitude, precision, and accuracy coming back to God's righteousness again. The reason why God could say, look, this is what you've done, and this is why you're being judged, is based on this righteousness, God's plumb line, using his law against his own people of, of Israel. So the end of Israel came this way. The Assyrian conquested or took over nation states. Assyrians were awful people when it came to this. I think I referenced this last week. 
Uh, in fact, if you read in chapter 4, right after the cows of Bashan statement, he talks about how the women will literally be dragged out of the city by their noses through hooks in their noses, uh, which was one of the ways in which uh, actually people were uh, brought out of uh, any kind of city-state that way, literally hooks right through their nose, and they were dragged out of uh, wherever, whatever place they were in. And, and Amos says, this is going to happen to the, to the women in captivity. What happens then is that there's an Israelite dispersion. The ten tribes are never heard from again. They are literally scattered to the wind, and that was really the end of the northern uh, nation of Israel. Nowhere to run. Uh, if you read in chapter 9, he t uh, God says, you can dig till uh, you can dig no longer, I will find you. You can climb, you can hide, and God says, I will fix my eyes upon you, that is the people who have, need to be judged, for evil and not for good. Gee, does that sound vaguely familiar? Yeah, that comes right back out of chapter 5, where he says, you need to spurn evil and do what's good. And God flips that around and says, this is the reason why you're being judged, because you haven't done what is good. So let's come all the way back to Taylor again. And the kinds of things that he did, uh, even uh, decades ago in a class that I taught, uh, here is this paucity of hymns on the judgment of God. And I would like to suggest for anybody who is musically oriented here that this might actually be something that we do. So forgive me as I actually point out something very specific that we do. We sing way too many happy songs. We sing too many songs that make us feel good. And we don't have any songs like we find in the Psalms, 70% of the Psalms are laments, nor do we find any hymns against God's people with God's anger, wrath, and justice in mind. I highly recommend that we begin to think about these things, much less actually write a song that might actually sing about it, because as Flannery O'Connor has said, if you won't listen, I'll shout. You've seen this at the top of each of these handouts uh, each of these weeks. So. I'll uh, make a few comments here. Uh, don't think we'll even have time for questions today, but feel free to come on up afterwards. Uh, here's the first one. Choice and election is not divine favoritism. So here we are in a PCA church. We're all about Calvinism. We just think this is great stuff, and it is. I am thoroughly reformed in my theology. But if we think for one moment that this is some kind of get out of jail free card, that we can do no, we can do all this bad stuff and God's still going to take care of us. I got another thing coming, man. You got to read Amos. So here it is, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, choice and election is not divine favoritism. The second comment, if you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. This is out of 2 Chronicles, but certainly applies in Amos's case here as well. The idea of being found and forsaken is a real crucial component to the book of Isaiah and a judgment against God's people. Be wary that the justice rolling down like waters, if you remember that famous line out of uh, Amos chapter 5 and verse 22, does not roll over you. That you only look for justice in the things that you believe in. Go back to something I said earlier about be wary that you just aren't pointing fingers at all the things you hate but recognizing that all the things you love also have problems as well. They shall fall and never rise again. This is right out of Amos chapter 8 and verse 14. This is problematic, obviously, because the ten nations are gone. This is the end. God's judgment comes against his people, which, of course, really speaks to the issue of how God always keeps a remnant. That is, some group of people of his who's going to come and continue the line, which, of course, is the nation of Judah. So we have a hope for the future. Uh, chapter 9, verses 11 to 15 emphasize through this group called the remnant, again, we find them all the way through uh, First Testament teaching. And one last line here, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to recognize this, out of 2 Corinthians 13, 5, that we need to test ourselves to see if we are in the faith. And I emphasize this because this is a statement right out of 2 Corinthians 13. If we think that we're all that, if we think that we've arrived, if we think that we've been baptized and we're in a covenant family or whatever other PCA language you want to utilize, and continue to live as God speaks against in the book of Amos, 
then we need to really consider what 2 Corinthians 13.5 means for any one of us personally. This is one of those teachings that's really harsh, and it's not meant to be my me. It's just what Scripture teaches. So I hope that we all take this to account. Uh, we're over time, but thanks for being here today, and we'll see you again next week.